organizers for inviting me to this um, exceptional <laughs> workshop. But thank you. Please do that again if you must. And yeah, before I go further, um, I'd like to advertise um, a review that we have just finished today. And in hindsight, actually, I think this would have been a much better title. We have maybe attracted a few more people in the audience as well. I think it's on. Um, maybe it's in the wrong place. Is, is that better? Yeah, good. Yeah, so as I was saying, um, probably a much better title for this talk would have been Cosmological Aspects of Higgs Vacuum Metastability. And that's because, of course, that's physically interesting, whereas this effective potential thing is probably something that is, I mean, as a technical exercise, interesting, but of course, most physicists are interested in, well, applications. But so hopefully this review will be uploaded today, which means that it will be out on the archive probably on Thursday, I think. And most of the stuff that I will talk about and what I, what I will present um, is, is in fact motivated by this vacuum metastability. The reason why we went through this fairly technical endeavor of deriving the effective potential was precisely to investigate the, this metastability issue. And our collaboration consists of, well, at the moment, four people. So two are from Imperial College, Artur Rajantiev and Stephen Stopiero. Actually, he's now at UCL, but he was at Imperial. And then Sami Nurmi from, from Uvascula. And we've been working on various aspects of this for maybe four years. Right. And if the editor of the, um, of the journal who invited us to write the review is in the, in the audience, apologies for being eight months late, but it's now finished. Okay. So, first, a bit of motivation. I already explained why this is interesting. So this is now a schematic illustration of the potential of the standard model. So as we know, the, somehow the defining characteristic is that the Higgs field, or the length of the Higgs doublet here, is, here I denoted with phi, has a vacuum expectation value away from zero. And this is, of course, crucial if we want to give masses for the gauge bosons in such a way that we don't violate gauge invariance. So this is standard. And it's also extremely interesting to study, okay, so how does the potential, which now is taken to include quantum corrections, how does the potential behave if I try to probe extremely large field values? And if you do that, you will realize something extremely interesting, which is that for some values of the, uh, uh, of the experimental input, or mostly the input of the top quark mass and the Higgs mass, you get results where, in fact, another minimum emerges at very large field values. So this is sort of a magnification of this. This happens at, a, at an extremely large scale. And the precise way in which this potential behaves is extremely sensitive to the precise input you get from, essentially, from colliders. And you can find solutions where you have almost immediately um, a second minimum, or you can find solutions where the electroweak minimum here is, in fact, in some sense, the true vacuum of the system. Um, this is something that I, I would imagine many people have seen, although not that many people understand where it comes from, <coughs> at least when you do calculations, which is um, the approximate result of how the effective potential for the Higgs behaves when you go to a very large field value. So essentially, you, go to such, you probe such high scales that the mass parameters or the electroweak scales are completely irrelevant. So then what you will get as an approximation, and I will hopefully motivate this soon, um, you get a result where you have almost the, the usual tree-level result, but with the, with the running coupling where the scale is set by the field itself. Now, if we suspend this belief and, and assume that this is true, then what this tells you immediately that if the coupling, uh, the four-point coupling of the Higgs, if it runs in such a way that at some point it crosses zero, well, then obviously you get this other minimum because then you get to, well, negative potential energies. And if this happens, you have a new minimum. Well, from very basic physical uh, principles, what you get is that if you wait long enough, your system should relax into this other minimum because that's, in fact, the true minimum of, well, of your system. And, of course, that's eventually where everything ends up. And if this, this decay happens, it's... Um, it is 
inconsistent with what we observe today, we observe today because what we observe is the electric vacuum. So this is in, in many ways a motivation for new physics if you have a prediction from the standard model that this happens. Now, one word about this, this whole setup is that, I mean, we are assuming that we have the standard model and only the standard model. And many people will then ask me, okay, but I mean, we know already that the standard model is not the full story, which is true. But the, the whole point of this exercise of studying the stability of the standard model is that if it's true that the standard model is, for example, from a cosmological perspective, inconsistent with, with observations, that is yet another motivation for uh, beyond the standard model physics. So that's, that's sort of the point, that if you have an inconsistency with respect to this metastability and you, you essentially tunnel into a, into a minimum which you know that is, is not correct, then that, that's like saying that, you know, we have masses for the neutrinos and standard model doesn't give masses. So again, it's a motivation why, why we must have beyond the standard model physics. So this is pretty much, I think, a state-of-the-art plot of how precisely this four-point coupling of the Higgs behaves. So if you remember that, approximation that I showed you where you have just a uh, quartic term and then a coupling in front of it, you see that um, the central value of how this coupling runs, um, the central value being at the center, you see that it crosses zero around 10 to the 10 GeV, which is commonly known as the instability scale. So at that scale, you say that the system essentially generates a new minimum. And this is, this is dependent on the in inputs, as I already mentioned, that there, there's a bit of uncertainty that goes into here, which you can see that there is, I mean, these are the three sigma bands, so these are, there's a pretty wide band. And also note that there is still a possibility that is, I think, in the three sigma region, but closer to the two sigma re region, where the four-point coupling never crosses zero. And that would mean that the electroweak minimum is, in fact, the true minimum of the theory. But 10 to the 10, if you take the, if you take the central values, 10 to the 10 GeV is currently what is known as the instability scale. So it's, it's a high scale, but considering inflation, for example, it's not a huge scale. Okay, so suppose you have a potential that is metastable, or rather there's a true minimum at some high value. Well then, you will tunnel into the other minimum. And of course, the question is how long does it take and is it inconsistent, but you will tunnel there. Or you can fluctuate around the barrier. So essentially, you could say that there are three ways of of making your way into the other minimum when you start here. So you could tunnel through it, you could jump above it, or you could sort of climb the potential a little bit, and then you would tunnel through it. And depending on the sort of physical situation you're studying, one of these processes is probably dominant. But that's essentially the gist of it, that if you have a metastable potential, you have this tunneling effect which is calculable, and we know how to calculate it. And here is, again, I think the state of the art, I mean, based on the, a plot that is based on the state of the art results, where we have three regions which are called instability, um, metastability and stability, or instability region and, and so forth. And how metastability is defined is the following way, that you have indeed a second minimum in your Higgs potential, which will give you a probability of essentially tunneling into that other vacuum. But we call the system metastable if, given the finite lifetime of the universe, this tunneling is so improbable that it, it should not have happened yet. Which means that the current observation of the electroweak vacuum is not inconsistent with the fact that you have um, a true minimum into which you will eventually tunnel and the universe will collapse and that's it. But still, that's the, that's the definition of metastable. And the stable region is the region where um, the four-point coupling of the Higgs is never negative, and then you don't have this problem. Um, often when I show this plot, many people are quick to point out that it is still possible that um, you have no other minimum when you go to large field values, which is true. However, without any theoretical priors or prejudices, um, given current data, you can say that it is more probable that the standard model is metastable than stable. That's a factually correct statement. It is more probable if, I mean, if you don't think that they're somehow theoretically favored that you have a stable uh, potential, it is more probable that we in fact live in a metastable, uh, in a universe with a metastable standard model. So that's the, yeah, that was sort of the introduction. So three main points. The first is that 
The central va values give us a metastable universe, but its lifetime it is, is much, much longer than the age of the universe. So essentially there is no contradiction. But the main focus of, of this whole calculation, which I will present to you, is, okay, what happens in the early universe? Because in the early universe, when, as, as cosmologists, we know that you have inflation, you have preheating, you have all sorts of extremely dynamical things going on. You can, in fact, um, excite the system or, or trigger the vacuum decay much easier than what would, what would be possible today. And that is, in fact, then a problem, because then you have this... Uh, this requirement of cosmological consistency with a metastable standard model. And that's super interesting because you can sort of use cosmology to get bounds for particle physics, which you otherwise couldn't. And the main problem that you then face is that everything that I've now showed you has based on a usual field theory calculation that you would, I mean, the, the normal calculation that you would find in Peskin and Schroeder, a loop calculation with, I mean, cer certain very refined set tricks, but a, um, a loop calculation in flat space. But the thing is, in the early universe, you cannot assume the universe to be flat because it is strongly curved, especially during inflation and reheating. And in order to investigate truly how does the standard model now behave in the early universe, then you must calculate the effective potential on a curved background. And this was somehow the motivation why we started, why we started this project, which turned out to be quite difficult, but ultimately, fortunately, doable. And now, Hopefully, in an understandable manner, I will go through in some detail how this calculation works. And please, at any point, stop me and I'll, I'll try to explain myself better if I can. But, right, let us proceed. So, on this slide, this is something that I'm sure for anyone who's, who's gone to a course of quantum, on quantum field theory, you've seen at least a few times. This is the standard Coleman and Weinberg calculation for the one loop effective potential for a very simple theory which is with a scalar field that has a mass and a four point interaction. And if you do the loop calculation, what you will get as a one loop result is this logarithmic piece that hopefully looks familiar, which is dependent on a effective mass, which is the second derivative of the classical potential. This is fairly standard stuff. Now the thing that is extremely important for our purposes is the renormalization scale, which is now called mu. So this is the scale if you had and when you have observational input. You always have to uh, provide a result with observational input. This is the scale at which your observational input sort of is fixed. And for the standard model, this would be electroweak scale or something of that order. Now the thing is, as I showed you in one of my slides, the instability scale is around 10 to the 10 GeV. Now the problem you will get is that if you wish to use this to probe those big scales, this renormalization scale mu, if it's order 10 to the 2 GeV, and then you have the instability scale, the mass can be dropped out. Here, which is 10 to the 10 GeV, you, you run into the problem of having a big logarithm. And this is indeed a problem because if you, if you had done a calculation to two loop order, you would have gotten higher powers of these logarithms. And if it's much larger than one, it means that your expansion breaks down. It has broken down a long time, a long time before you reach scales 10 to the 10 GE me. So you have this um, pretty difficult issue of, of large logarithms. You are extending your calculation way beyond its range of validity. So how to deal with this? And this is all in flat space and this is all done by other people than us. This is sort of standard technology. So, the requirement of renormalization group invariance or RG invariance is simply phrasing the statement that renormalization and the scale that is involved in renormalization is in principle an arbitrary choice. When you do a field theory calculation, you could have chosen any scale for renormalization. And the, the crucial point is that the physics that you get, that shouldn't depend on renormalization. It's, it's a choice. And if you, from, uh, from your result, if you demand, if you explicitly write down this requirement that my physics should not depend on the renormalization scale, what you then get are the kalan zumanzig equations, which lead to the effect of running parameters, which is something that most people have heard of. So coupling constants depend on the scale at which you probe them. Now this is now the trick that you can use. It feels a bit strange at first, and this is something that most people are not familiar with, mostly because you can't find this in textbooks, 
But this whole requirement of renormalization group invariance means that you are free to choose your renormalization scale to be anything, also a field dependent object. So you're free to choose, for example, that your renormalization scale is the field itself. Now, this, I mean, if you just take my word for it, you can sort of quite easily see that the problem of large logarithms vanishes because um, uh, in the logarithm you don't have this um, huge separation of scales anymore. So if you do that, then what you will get is that the one loop correction stays under control and then the leading term is now this tree level term with a coupling that runs according to the field. Yes. Variable, variable, the field variable itself. So it, 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 is, it is not a constant, it's the field. I mean, that's, that's the funny part. You can choose it to be the field phi itself, and not at a scale, but you know, the, the, the field variable. And that, that's, that's to do with the fact that this requirement, which is a requirement, a sort of a very basic requirement for the full quantum result which you obviously never can derive, but that requirement tells you that mu can be anything. So you can change it however which way you want. I mean the, the papers by Espinoza and Strumia who do this very carefully, I suggest you take a look, but I was very puzzled by this as well when I saw it. But this is, I mean, this is a loud trick to, to use. Yeah. Uh, sorry, could you repeat? The first equation, you have the derivative of the effective in terms of mu. Mm -hmm. So if I plug back that result, I'm just saying that this is the minimum of your effective potential. Uh, you, yeah, so you sort of, no, you sort of have to be careful because this means that every single, this is um, dependence of the coupling constants as well as everything else. So I mean, the, all the coupling constants and everything depend on the, on the, on the field itself. So, yeah, right. Um, I better move on. Okay, one, one point to make is that it, uh, this approximation that you often find in, in papers that um, apply this result to, for example, Higgs inflation or something like that, it's not um, super accurate always. So in principle, you should include the loop correction as well, but as a leading approximation, as you would normally write it down, it is, it is, it is fine. But the main point is this, now, if you have a theory with lots of fermions, the, the way in which this, this coupling runs is, of course, dependent on your theory itself. And if you have a lot of fermions, they just happen to behave in such a way that they um, push this coupling down. So the more fermions you have, uh, the quicker you will go down, and eventually you may cross zero. Um, I think I should speed up a bit. So this is a Yukawa theory example, which is nice because you can do it analytically, but that's not super important because um, ultimately we're not interested in the Yukawa theory. So let's move on and now proceed to a curved background. So this is of course now the, the thing that we're very interested in. So on a curved background, let's do exactly the same thing. So we have the same theory, but now we have relaxed the assumption that our background is flat. Our background is curved and it could be curved in any which way we want. So we're not focusing solely on, for example, FRW spaces, but it could be anything. So what you get is now as a one loop correction, and I will go through sort of the derivation a bit later, but just believe me when I say that this is now the, for our purposes, the relevant one loop contribution, and it looks very much like the uh, one loop contribution I showed in the sort of Coleman and Weinberg example, but now you have the scalar curvature of gravity playing a role. And this will bring about a crucial difference. So the first thing is something that many people know, which you can see, is that from the loop correction, you generate a term that mixes the scalar curvature of gravity and Higgs. And this is the non-minimal term, which is quite familiar. And, and the point is that if you generate it by loops, you should have it from the very start. And in fact, I will show this. Um, a more formal way of, of making this argument is that if you write down the beta function for this non-minimal coupling, zero is not a fixed point. So it means that if you choose it to be zero for some theory, you will generate it ultimately at some point. And from that you can conclude and that in fact in the standard model, you must have a non-minimal coupling. We don't know what value it has 
And we know that it's extremely poorly constrained by experiments, which is not surprising because it's sort of a gravitational operator, but it should be there. I mean, you could choose it to be 1 over 6, which is the conformal point. That's a fixed point, and that's a consistent choice. But if you choose it to be 0, that's only valid at some particular scale. I guess this, this bound comes from graviton scatterings or something like that. But anyway, it's pretty much not a bound at all. Right. So now let's proceed in exactly the same way as we proceeded for the Coleman and Weinberg example. And let's now do renormalization group improvement, which was the trick of choosing the scale. And now since our logarithm contains the scalar curvature, we unavoidably um, run into a situation where in fact the running scale gets a contribution from the background curvature. And this is um, a very big difference because it could be in the early universe that the um, the scale given by gravity, curvature, is much, much bigger than any other scale in your, in your problem. So as sort of a summary of the differences that you get, when you do this calculation in flat space, you can, to a good approximation, you can use this as an approximation, which is always done. If you're probing regions where the background curvature is huge, so Hubble rate is the largest scale, you have, well, sort of a similar term but the running is now almost completely dominated by essentially gravity. And then you always generate also this non-minimal term. Now, unfortunately, this is not the whole story. Now it gets a bit messy, but hopefully not too much. Yeah. You are correct. Thank you. Uh, sorry, so in, in this point, I am in a, in a Friedman universe, but everything up to here um, is not. So this is simply because in, in most applications you're in a Friedman universe, but you don't need to do that. The, the result that you get from this technology that I hopefully have time to discuss will be for a general, I mean, general background. It could be anything. Um, right, that was the... That was the one loop result that I already showed you, but in fact, unfortunately, you do get all sorts of messy contributions on top of that. So this, for, with, with exactly the same logic that we said that the non-minimal coupling has to be there, all these operators, even if you just have the standard model, if it's on a curved background, all these operators have to be there because they're radiatively generated. And these terms are in some sense perhaps subdominant or subleading because they only couple to the Higgs logarithmically. But the important point is that they do couple to the Higgs. They do feed into this whole effective potential for the Higgs. And in the early universe, you just, you just absolutely have to take this into consideration. So I'm going to go through this slightly uh, quickly because this is not massively important, at least not for everyone. But if you have a particle theory such as the standard model, um, you have a well-defined answer to the question, what are the beta functions for all the generated operators? So in the standard model, what you would have is that first, this would be the gravitational, quote-unquote, Lagrangian, that you must have because all these operators are generated anyway, and these would be the beta functions. So here, for example, you see that if xi equals zero, this is a combination of all the Yukawa couplings, and this is from the Higgs, um, xi equals zero, is not, the, the right-hand side is not zero, which means that when you change the scale, you will generate psi. And the same goes for pretty much everything else. Now, I'm not an expert on quantum gravity, but um, this is, I mean, this is, from a quantum gravity point of view, I guess, a problematic statement because you have all these weird r mu nu, r mu nu, and Riemann tensor squared type of terms, which I think sometimes at least lead to ghosts. Yeah. Yes. Which procedure do you use for the normalization? Because in the first case, uh, normalization is uh, very complicated. First of all, the order goes in which uh, we go seek to add this higher curve uh, type in the procedure. First of all, for instance, uh, what's called the other procedure that the vacuum uh, regularity. Are, are you talking about? Uh, are you talking about adiabatic subtraction? Yes. Uh, you, you do generate them. 
I mean, I mean let's, let me put it this way. You do uh, create a non-zero beta function for them. So they, they are there. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I mean, you are allowed to subtract them everything at some scale, but the problem is that they would, you would regenerate them if you go to another scale. So, I mean, I, mean, I, I do know, I mean, in an adiabatic subtraction, what you will get is that you will get a counter term that is a combination of everything that is shown here. I mean, because any covariant renormalization prescription will ultimately give you um, a Lagrangian that is a scalar curvature. I mean, we can discuss later, but I, I would, okay, yeah. I would maybe, it's a good idea maybe if I speed up again a bit. But just to flash you, this is the full result for the standard model only for those degrees of freedom that coupled to the Higgs. So it looks very much again like the um, and this is in the situ space, by the way. Um, looks very much like the Coleman and Weinberg result, but um, you just essentially have a contribution coming from every single degree of freedom of your theory. That's the way it works. But, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's not important. What is important, if we now take the full result for the effective potential in curved space, and then we start investigating that starting from a Hubble rate that is very small, the situation when you have a metastable potential, how does it behave when we start sort of cranking up the Hubble rate? How does the potential behave? And first, this is the result that is essentially a flat space result. But once you start increasing your Hubble rate, so this is the instability scale, so we sort of use that as a normalization, what you see is that the barrier becomes less and less robust, and then at some point it disappears completely. And the whole effective potential is, is relevant for this calculation, but mostly this is because you generate a non-minimal coupling that has a minus sign in front. So this whole calculation it was done in such a way that at, at the electroweak scale, we set the non-minimal coupling to zero. And as I already mentioned, you always generate it. Then it just so happens that in the standard model, you generate a negative non-minimal coupling, and then the barrier vanishes and you get a result. If you compare this to this, you get something that is completely different to what you would get from a flat space approximation. Uh, I will skip this. This is about essentially why is it okay to do this calculation on a curved background and why don't I need to take into account loops of, of gravity. And the, the short answer is that um, we are probing scales that are much, much below um, the Planck mass. And also the, 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 the field that we're interested in is a spectator, so it doesn't dominate the energy density, but you can ask me about that. But now, a crucial slide, because um, for people who worked on quantum fields on curved backgrounds, what I've now shown might seem a bit funny, because for example, if you've done a calculation in the Sitter space, we all know that you have these very intricate infrared effects that occur in the Sitter space for any quantum field theory. So this calculation that I've shown you is only the ultraviolet. So what it allows you to do is to calculate all the new operators that you generate, all the beta functions correctly that you generate, but that's it. And this is a universal contribution from sort of field theory, from a field theory perspective, just like if you would do a calculation in flat space, you can say that renormalization, uh, uh, the renormalization, the, the divergences that are involved are universal, they're always the same, and beta functions are always the same, and the same applies here. So if you would do the, the full calculation, including the infrared, then you have this very complicated problem of, of inputting boundary conditions and, and this quantum state itself in which you do the calculation, which is something you must address, but you can sort of treat this contribution as something that is always there. And in fact, that's a good thing because um, there have been a few talks. I have a separate slide about this because so many people have mentioned this. And I think only one is in the audience now. It was made for them, but fine. So the, the point is that if you wish to calculate the, the infrared part on a curved background, which is often um, difficult, what you can do is basically you can use this result as your input. So I'm going to show this very quickly. So this is now the stochastic approach that has been mentioned at least by four people already in this conference. So indeed, in the stochastic approach, what you will do is you will use the trick of treating the ultraviolet, which is exactly the calculation which we, which we did field theoretically, treat the ultraviolet as a white noise. 
And then, because in the city space, for example, the infrared dominates everything, you have infrared enhancement, you can use, for example, this very clever trick by Starobinsky, where you solve the probability distribution from a Fokker-Planck equation. But now the problem is that if you wish to study, for example, how does a potential behave when you have this instability, that was purely an ultraviolet effect. That comes from the fact of how precisely the couplings run. And the price you have to pay if you do a stochastic analysis is that you just don't see the ultraviolet correctly. Because otherwise you would have a full field theory result. And unfortunately the approximations that you make that, that make the calculation tractable, those approximations essentially, I mean, they, this is precisely the information that they discard. But what we would advoca advocate is that if you wish to include these ultraviolet effects, the running of couplings and the, the possibility of having a metastable vacuum, you would just take this ultraviolet result that we have and use that as a source term in your Fokker Planck and then you would have a result that sort of gets both worlds. Perhaps not correctly completely because again it's, it's, it's not very realistic that you have a technology that gives you everything because I mean it's, it's a hard problem but it would probably give you the relevant, the relevant infrared portion and the relevant ultraviolet portion. And we had I mean many talks about um, for example, if you have a lot of scalar fields during the sitter inflation. So my question would be, is that, is it consistent to maintain the non-minimal coupling equals zero for 60 E folds? Because during inflation, uh, we are not in exact the sitter. The scale of inflation will change by, usually by an order of magnitude. And when that happens, even if you have a theory that is, for example, quartic, um, that you start with a quartic, you will generate a non-minimal coupling, which could be relevant. Especially if you have, like in many models, if you have, I don't know, 10 to the 5 light fields, which all couple to the Higgs, they would give a massively large beta function. And it could be that this, this plays a role. It's just, I mean, I would very much like to discuss those, those people who um, were studying these models, but uh, unfortunately they're not here. But this is just food for thought. Is it true that the six would also take the point of the uh, Sorry? A sixth, yeah. Is it repulsive or a Oh, that's a good question. I think it's repulsive, but I'm not sure. Uh, in, your, in your proper, the, yeah. the shape was, was going to be the tensor yeah. barrier was collapsing. You said you, you started at zero and then you were being driven away from it. Yes. So it turns on the other side of the fixed point. What yeah. Happen? I think it could, it could probably uh, become even larger and larger, so it would stabilize it. Stabilize. Yeah, I think so. But that, yeah, that's a good point. I, I remember once calculating that, but I forget. I mean, you should see it from the beta function. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, so I think I have maybe 10 minutes. Uh, 50. 50? Okay, good. Oh, yeah. Uh, right. So the main reason why we did this calculation, it's a, it's a fairly technical calculation. And I mean, if you're interested in the details, then please ask me. But the whole point was I mean, not just to derive something difficult, but hopefully get some bounds for particle theories from cosmology. So I'm, I'm sure everybody remembers the um, suggestion from the BISEC group saying that the scale of inflation is around 10 to the 13 or 14 GeV. Now, almost immediately after, there were a bunch of papers then saying that um, if we have a metastable uh, electroweak theory, then because of these stochastic fluctuations, your field will sort of random walk over the barrier and you would have a vacuum decay induced by inflation and hence there's a severe problem. Now, this is not entirely correct because these calculations all use the flat space effective potential. But if you do it carefully, if you actually derive from first principles to curved space effective, uh, effective potential, you still get almost exactly the same thing that um, you can stabilize or destabilize your system during inflation. You can also stabilize it quite easily and it's mostly usually due with the non-minimal coupling because that's sort of the dominant term. It can give you either a robust barrier or it can give you, if, if the sign is negative, it can sort of enhance the instability. So you could study during inflation. You could study this, for example, by using the stochastic approach, which will give a very similar result to the hawking moss instanton. But now I'm simply doing the calculation by using the hawking moss instanton because, I mean, you mostly, when you approximate it, you, you mostly or almost exactly you get the same, um, same criterion. So the, the calculation here, or the red and green re regions, now refer to regions where the universe collapses during inflation and where the universe doesn't. Now, it, it is a function of the non-minimal coupling because, as, as I've mentioned, that is essentially the, the dominant parameter uh, in the early universe. I mean, the whole effective potential does play a role. 
but the non-minimal coupling is. That's, that's the essential ingredient. So one thing to no note is that everything that is dangerous happens when you have a scale of inflation that is large. So if you have a low scale model of inflation, of inflation this problem is not there. So that's why the bicep suggestion was very important because I mean it, it gave us a huge number for, for the Hubble rate during inflation. And also the non-minimal coupling, if you approach the conformal point, then you start reaching a point where everything is fine. And the conformal point, because um, the mass parameter of the Higgs at, at such high scales is completely irrelevant, you have to a very good approximation and conformally symmetric theory. And that sort of doesn't feel the background. So when you approach the conformal point for the Higgs theory, for example, then, then you're fine. Now, after inflation, this is something that I think is sort of even more interesting. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think it was 10 to the 13 GeV. So this instability scale, if that is 10 to the 10, it would be here. Yeah. So even then you, you could have stabilized the universe with a non-minimal coupling, but yeah. So after inflation. This, I mean, I'm a huge fan of this because this is something that not that many people know of. And I think this is, this is neat. So after inflation, now I've hopefully given enough motivation for this non-minimal coupling. So after inflation, if the scalar curvature of gravity, if, if this is a negative, this will give you a tachyonic mass term, which, us which usually or always it means a huge explosive particle creation. And you can easily solve this because if, if your field is a spectator and now this phi, capital phi is now the inflaton. So the inflaton is what gives you the scalar curvature. If the inflaton oscillates, well then the scalar curvature will be negative after inflation. So this is for three examples. So these are the inflaton potentials and that's the scalar curvature. So if the inflaton oscillates, you see that every time the inflaton crosses zero, because it, its potential is zero, but it has kinetic energy, the scalar curvature is negative. And at each of these regions, what you will have is explosive particle production for any field that has a non-minimal coupling. And this is unavoidable and this is very generic for um, any theory of, of inflation, that you have some kind of oscillations or something that drive the scalar curvature to negative after inflation. So this is kination, where you simply say that the potential vanishes after inflation. And what does this do? These are now the regions where the Higgs would get a huge amplification. Um, you, just like during inflation, you have, a, you, have a set, you have a setup where after inflation you can generate such a huge amplification of the Higgs that it sort of jumps over the barrier and your universe collapses. But here the important point is that the larger the non-minimal coupling is, the, um, the more dangerous the situation is. So this um, period after inflation limits the non-minimal coupling um, at, the, at the other end when it's large. So this is roughly non-minimal coupling equals five. So if the Hubble rate is, or here it's normalized with the instability scale, if it's 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12 GeV, then essentially the non-minimal coupling, for example, for the Higgs should be, um, it shouldn't be greater than five, but it should also be greater than, um, I think it was one over 10. So it, it should somehow, it is sort of, it is constrained to be close to the conformal point, I guess what I'm trying to say. Um, I still have a bit of time and this is um, something I very much like to talk about even though it's perhaps not hugely relevant but as I already mentioned any decoupled scalar will be generated after inflation if it has a non-minimal coupling and from field theory principles hopefully I've motivated that you should put that there. What happens is that you can generate dark matter. So again this would be the potential for the inflaton and this chi is just some scalar field that is decoupled, which has um, a, a four-point coupling and a mass. And what you get is a situation that any field that is decoupled and has this nominal coupling will be generated after inflation. And in fact, these regions tell you that if the, if the particle is too massive, you easily overclose the universe. So this is a hugely strong effect. And often when you have gravitational particle production, it's, it's, it's never very potent. But in this case it is because it comes from this tachyonic instability. And these we call despicable dark relics. And the word despicable is simply because this is very generic. Because this happens almost every time, pretty much every time you have a non-minimal coupling. And it's 
pretty much undetectable. So I'm not sure if it's completely undetectable, but since it's a decoupled singlet, so the only thing that feels the background, it's, it's the scalar curvature of gravity, which is a player in the early universe, but not much afterwards. So if you have a theory that has, I mean, lots and lots of decoupled sectors, and well, you think that everything is fine, it could very well be that you immediately after inflation, you overclose the universe because all of these sectors will get excited, even though you don't couple, well, to any other, you, you, even if you, those sectors don't couple to anything else except for gravity, and gravity always couples to everything. Gra by gravity, I mean the scalar curvature R. So this took longer than I thought, but here are my, my conclusions, and there are a few minutes for questions, so thank you.